I'm your host, Ken Gurr, and this is Straight Outta Gabriola. The crux of it is that no matter how difficult the situation, no matter how dire the circumstance, whether you're just absolutely being crushed by, by everything around you, you can, you can always find the one thing, the very simplest, easiest one thing that you can do now that will get you to maybe the next step and the next step and the next step. On this episode, we're featuring the Ocean's Epic with Gabriela's own Bert Terhart. And this is the first of two chapters. Bert Tahart has made his mark in history as the first North American to sail solo west to east around the five great capes of the Southern Hemisphere. He sailed non-stop using only celestial navigation. He has been followed by thousands from the world over, including school children in their classrooms as far away as Kenya. It has been a journey filled with emotional ups and downs as he's encountered gale-driven seas that were only relieved by nerve-wracking still air when he's becalmed. You can tuck in to an excellent read of his entire adventure on his blog, thefivecapes.com. That's the number five, and I've put a link to the blog site on the show's notes to this episode. There you will see more about the route that Bert took and read all of the blog entries and comments from the thousands of people that followed him. Bert's journey took him past all the great points of land in the Southern Hemisphere, starting in his case with the treacherous Cape Horn at the tip of South America and then heading east through the South Atlantic and points beyond. All the real-time entries are there to read on his blog, which he sent by satellite email when he could to his sister, Leia, back here on the west coast of Canada. In both these chapters of Ocean's Epic with Bert Terhart, I should let you know that this is not a chronological retracing of Bert's voyage in audio. You can see and read that best on Bert's blog. And because I'm not a sailor, Though I've spent a little bit of time on boats and sailed with friends and family, I worked my way up to the rank of assistant to the scupper cleaner. I'm afraid you old salts should be forewarned, if you're listening, that this is not about rigging and gearhead stuff and what did you do when this happened in those conditions. Though, of course, we get into lots of fascinating stories of the sights, sounds, hardships, and reactions of Bert living through nine months at sea alone. I really wanted to find out the whys and the whats of how Bert took on this challenge for himself. Can any of us relate to something so extraordinary? Well, listen into what Bert has to say, including the whole notion of what extraordinary really means to him. Here's Ocean Epic with Bert to Heart, Chapter 1. I had not entertained I'm going to sail around the world alone. Not until probably, I'd say, 2017. And what, what came into your head that made you say, okay, let's, I'm going to do this? Well, well I guess, um, you know, you're getting older. So, and the oldest person to do it is 70, 76. Um, Jan Socrates is a Canadian. Well, she's, a, she's Canadian now. She, she was a Brit. Um, she's been around the world five times, not all of them unassisted, not all of them nonstop, but she's the oldest person to sail uh, nonstop around the world. But, well, you can't, the only way to do it is to go by the five great capes. You can't sail nonstop through right. the Panama Canal or the Suez. But, right. And if you're on this coast, <clears throat> it's down to Cape Horn and shag a left. Yeah, it's really <laughs> difficult. The number of people to do it on this, on, from the West Coast is only, I'm the fourth. Right. It's really hard because... All the way, a good chunk of the way down to Cape Horn is against the wind, and almost all the way back after New Zealand is against the wind. So that's, I think I traveled more close to easily 6,000 nautical miles against the wind, which is, if you're a sailor, you know what, you know what that's like. Yeah. 
Born and raised near Esteban in southern Saskatchewan, Bert says he knew when he was about age 10 that sailing was going to be an integral part of his life. His dad taught him on a small prairie reservoir, and he was hooked. Sailing anything he could find, dinghies, homemade rafts, a rubber inner tube, and Bert's family immigrated to Canada from Holland. Many of his relatives, of course, being Dutch, were seagoing folk. The Esteban Mercury that wrote an article <laughs> yeah. at the end of July, you said uh, in, in the article, it's unbelievably powerful to know that there are people pulling for you, genuine, sincere, caring people that you've never met. Every now and then I would get a snippet of something that would lift me up from the deepest, darkest hole and make me say, I can do it. Mm -hmm. I love that because, <laughs> I mean, now you've had you know a little bit of time to reflect back. Do you ever get a shudder of like, oh, God, that was, I was at my lowest of my lows. I was almost ready to pull the plug on this trip. Like, was there times like that where it came along or do you just too focused on the task? Well, you're very focused on the task, but I, I never was, I never felt like I was going to pull the plug ever. And that's... And that didn't start with this trip. That started, maybe it's my, you know, maybe it's army training. I'm, I'm not sure what the case might be, but yeah. I think it, it just started, I guess, when I was growing up. But, I mean, I used to run cross country when I was in university and I played rugby. And uh, the, the, yeah. the, the point is, you never, I never started something thinking, well, if it gets hard, I'll quit. Like, you can't be in the army and think, you know what, if it gets a little tough, maybe I'll just pull the plug and go, go home and lay on the couch and watch TV. Like, that is not an option. Like, quitting isn't, it's not in your vocabulary. Right. And I've had that. It's not. Forget it. It's not. It can't even be part of your of your being. Like I've had that same discussion with, with other, um, of my old you know ex military guys and pals. And it's the same thing. So I asked my commanding officer, my old commanding officer, when the in the airborne, and I, and you know, I said, you know, did you ever, ever once in your entire career did you ever start something thinking that if it got tough you'd quit? And of course the answer is no. Yeah. So whether I was running or whether I was doing this, I never thought I was going to quit. So the, the moment I stepped off, the moment I left the dock, I figured I would come back to the dock. Yeah. And if I didn't come back to the dock, then something bad would have, you know, would have happened. I just wouldn't have quit because it's going to get hard. I mean, it's just, yeah. you just know. Yeah. But what, what is interesting about that particular quote and, and what I'm, I guess I'm referring to is that one of the goals that I had when I left was to inspire people. Like, and I had a, there's a couple of different whys. I'm sure we're going to talk about why, but mm -hmm. the, you know, there, there's the practical goal-oriented whys. So on a sort of on the, on the surface, but I, I wanted to um, inspire kids to seek careers um, in, in the um, atmospheric and oceanic sciences. That's my academic training. That's what I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. I, wanted, I wanted people to, of all ages, to have the courage to to step out the front door and, and actually engage in some kind of adventure, whether that be big or small. And I know that relates to you because you've you know, the mm -hmm. whole time we've talked together, you've obviously traveled, mm -hmm. you obviously have some perspective. You know what it means to step outside in a strange place and just be completely overcome with something that's totally unfamiliar to you in whatever context you want to frame it, whether it's mm -hmm. emotionally or spiritually or physically or whatever the case might be, mm -hmm. culturally, obviously. But, but here... You can. We live in an incredible part of the world where you can just literally step out your front door and be totally immersed in in, in an environment that may not have changed since Cook or La Perouse or Bly or any of those guys were here. So I, I wanted people to 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 go on these crazy adventures, whether they be big or small. So I wanted to inspire people to do that. And what I found fascinating to me was that I was completely and utterly buoyed up and motivated and and egged on and supported and cheered on by people I'd, I had no idea. So I was I, here. I thought that my grand adventure and all these things I was doing would be would be motivating others, and they may very that they may very well have been, but I was far more motivated by by those people. And I would I, I didn't know them like I'd never mm -hmm. met them. They could fall out of the sky and hit me, and I wouldn't know who they were. <laughs> and they would be. So, and I never I still haven't read all the social media. I yeah. haven't read anything. <laughs> but I would my sister would send me because I I mm -hmm. um I. I don't have. I didn't have access to the internet. I, yeah. I could only write something, and then she would post it, sort of. Thing. So she would send me back something like, you know, so and so said this, or yeah. you know, a little snippet, and it was unbelievably powerful. It was literally there. There was more than one occasion where those little tiny snippets leveraged me out of out of some deep dark hole. I well, believe. on that, that's a good segue into what I wanted to talk to you about mm -hmm. too, because one of your one of your blog entries. Of course, and there's a couple of things that came up, but let me just get it up here. Um, you used gobsmacked. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm referring to. <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, I love that. Like, I, I read, when I read that entry, 
I thought, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, of all the gin joints in all the world, you know, and here you are. So, I, you know, I'll just read this little blurb of this. So you're, you're uh, past Cape Horn, you're moving up towards the Falklands. Yeah. And, um, and you find out through your Iridium uh, satellite email that your sister sends you a note that there's someone who is on the Falklands who's been following yeah. your journey and actually was a crew on Sea Bourbon. Yeah. And actually, and, and asked you like this, kind of like the secret question, like is, there's a secret compartment in the main bulkhead forward of the mast. Is there? And then, you know, you knew it was the same boat. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so here you are. And there's a photo, of course, of this person because you didn't go ashore. You mm-hmm. held true to your, to your mission. Uh, this person came and, and mm-hmm. on, on. And I mean, again, like you say, <laughs> The magic and the uh, like, the magnificence of, of of that, of all things that you could happen, and all points in the world, and here yeah. you are running into someone who was on your boat. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, he he wasn't sure, but he recognized it as it was as I was being pounded out there in the harbor. Right. He goes, "I think that's so familiar." Because when he was on Suburban, it was a catch. It had two masts, right? Oh, okay. One of the masts is now gone. So yeah. you know, that's a pretty fundamental difference, right? Yeah. It was a relatively small boat. But he, yeah. he recognized it because he painted the bottom. It was one of the things he was, you know, when he was when he was being, you know, vetted as crew, they made him paint the bottom <laughs> of the boat. <laughs> so he recognized it because he'd actually crawled over every inch with a paintbrush. But, right, yeah. Honestly. Yeah, it's, it's and, his, and his, how he got there is also fascinating, right? So we have all these, <laughs> like it's beyond crazy yeah you know that that and he's the only well no there's probably there the boat was suburban was sold to owners who never put any crew on her so i think as far as i know there's probably only been well him and maybe mm-hmm. two other people who crewed on that boat hmm. out of the entire world mm-hmm. universe forget yeah. world universe yeah. right so and of all places you know, here you know. are right and i wasn't supposed to be there so. yeah you were ducking out for uh, yeah. uh right a gale and uh, and uh was it like what, what was it like a tropical what do you call it on that atlantic side is it like a typhoon a, no a, no like the, the the typhoons and and hurricanes and monsters well ty- typhoons are all those are tropical and, and subtropical storms right. okay so these are this is just a massive, massive. low pressure yeah. So, and um, you also typh- had to provision for food there too, no, right? No, no, I didn't. No. That was just a, an extra yeah. bonus. I knew that I was as soon as I I knew I was running out of food very quickly before I got to Cape Horn. I realized I was running out of food, mm-hmm. and I thought I was going to run out of food just by how much I was eating. And I before I left, I very carefully calculated how much food to bring, and um, on all my other trips, I had never. My appetite has actually had always gone down; it never gone up. So I, I figured my appetite wouldn't be much different than it was here at home, but mm-hmm. it turns out it was huge, huge. So I was just mowing through food. With the difference probably being temperature. Do you think the, the yes, co- yeah. yeah, there's something the like the what is it now in here? It's probably it's probably close to twenty degrees in here, mm-hmm. but inside the boat, so that's what seventy degrees. Mm-hmm. Inside the boat, for the most part, was like forty three. Mm-hmm. So it's cold and it's mm-hmm. wet. Like the humidity is at ninety percent, ninety five percent. So it's yeah. just really, really cold. And you're you're always wet. You're always cold. So yeah, the cold has got something to do with it. But the workload is enormous. And I knew that Volvo crews were they're eating something like six thousand calories a day. So when you know the the crewed boats that are going around the world yeah. in the Southern Ocean, they yeah. their they their their food budget is six thousand calories per person per day. Hmm. And I thought I'm not going to be that far south. It's not going to be that cold. The conditions aren't going to be that extreme. And I'm I'm only going to be working that hard because those guys are working really hard. But as it turns out, I was working that hard. I just wasn't that cold. Mm -hmm. Like for them, it's, you know, snow and Mm -hmm. the red. But Mm -hmm. I was never that far Mm -hmm. south. So cold, number one, but just the workload, number two. And Mm -hmm. I was just, I just mowed through so much stuff. So I, I knew I was running out of food. Yeah, and when I was in the Falklands, um, my sister was saying, well, "Maybe we can get you some food." Maybe we get. So I said, "No, no, no, no. It's too yeah. hard. Too much hassle." And and she and then I said, "Well, if I can put on some food, then then at least I'll have an extra month because I, I I basically had food for for nine months. That's what I figured. Well, basically eight months and change, but I was eating food almost twice as fast." Hmm. as I thought I would be like mm-hmm. I was probably doubling how much food I was eating mm-hmm. 
So I figured, wow, man, I'm, I'm going to be looking at six months, and I, then I'm going to run out of food. So that's when I was eating 800 calories a day. <laughs> that was when I was in the Falklands. So that was, I was eating that much, that, that much food after I left the Falklands. So that was, you know, through the southern uh, Atlantic and, right. and mm-hmm. into the southern Indian Ocean yes. and, that, and in the South Tasman Sea. I, I thought if I got a little bit of food in the Falklands, then, then at least I can, you know, at least I'll be able to, I won't be completely suffering. I'll just, mm-hmm. it'll just be miserable. <laughs> So I know, like Les Powell, for example, is a he's a UK single-handed guy who sailed around the world nonstop, unassisted, circumnavigated. He finished eating one tablespoon of rice a day and one tablespoon of water. That was his because he he ran out. So I figured I can get by if if he could do it, then I could do it. But I, I didn't want to be down to one tablespoon. Indeed, later on in the journey, as Bert passed the Southeast Cape in Tasmania and starts making his way back up into the Pacific for home. Food that is the fuel that is keeping Bert going, of course, becomes a concern once again. Here he recalls his conversation over email with his sister Leah. And and I was telling Leah, I said, I'm running out of food. And she said, well, what do you have left? So I wasn't telling her what I had left. I kept avoiding the question because I, I had nothing left. All I had left was rice and oats and quinoa. I'd eaten everything else. <laughs> And I, I had I had tasty bites. I had these. There's like Indian food. In the yeah, back. the tasty bites. Yeah, oh, those are fantastic. Yeah, they are. Yeah, so, they're good. Yeah. So those I still have them. In, so I, I love them. But I had some of that yeah. left. But everything else was gone. Yeah. And uh, I had a few cans of tuna left. Um. <laughs> yeah. Tuna. I tuna in oil. And so I was actually drinking oil because it was the most. The most calories I got in the day was drinking the can of oil, the oil that comes out of a can of tuna, which yeah. is pretty hideous, right? Yeah. <laughs> and mayonnaise, because I got this giant... Anyway, that, so I, I, my diet was pretty sparse, and, and uh, so I was telling Leah, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of food. because I And, and the plan was to... Because to, I was going to go right by Hawaii. I thought, if I can hold out to Hawaii. And then, of course, I'm thinking, I'm telling my sister I can hold out to Hawaii, but then after Hawaii, it's only another three weeks, so... Right. So I, th- she said, well... Why don't you sail past Rarotonga? And I said, well, it's going to be like 300, 200 or 50 miles out of my way. So she came back 24 hours later and said, okay, well, there's a, there's a possibility. And now you know, COVID has hit, right? So it's completely locked down. So, and I said, well, it's going to be too hard. I'm not going to be close enough. And then she said, well, I think we can do it. There's, and if you, I think we can actually get you some food there. And it'll be pretty easy, easier than actually than Hawaii. Um, because getting into the States was an in- impossibility. Like, mm-hmm. it was really, really tough. They, they, you couldn't, basically, right? Yeah. And New Zealand was the same. Like, a, the, the, the Australian consulate and the New Zealand consulate had, had... My sister had contacted them and said, if Bert runs into trouble, um, can he land in... You know, can he go to Perth or, or Melbourne and, or any place in... other place in Australia or New Zealand? And he just said flat out, no, just keep going. Well, we have an obligation to help him because of, you know, safety mm-hmm. of life at sea, mm-hmm. but the boat has to sink first. He's got to be in a life raft because otherwise, you know, we're not. Mm-hmm. So the, the response from hope that we got a nice gentle no from Australia, but we got a <laughs> flat out bugger off from New Zealand. <laughs> so the point was that Rarotonga is, it, it is, is administered by the New Zealand yes. government. Yeah. So they, have their, they have an island government, of course, but overseen yeah. by New Zealand. So they had a very um, strict lockdown and but they had sort of thought, well, maybe we could try. So I thought about this for like 24 hours and said, well, I can just divert a little tiny bit and I can sail past Rarotonga. And if it is possible, it's possible. So at least I can think about it for another 48 hours or 24 hours rather than just a hard no now and go by and miss it by 300. I was, I was running out of food. I knew it. So then when I got within, you know, pretty close, then it, it looked like we could do it, but there was some huge... It was going to be this really convoluted, difficult, next to impossible thing. But at that point, we were kind of committed to do it. It didn't turn out that way, but it, it was it, it was framed that way because of the lockdown procedures and messaging that was prevalent in the in the South Pacific at the right. time. I mean, there were sailboats and there was thousands of cruising sailors all over the South Pacific, stranded in places they couldn't leave. Yeah. Because you can only you can't travel in hurricane season and you can't go home. Yeah. And you can't go to another island. You're yeah. stuck where you are. Yeah. So there was 
like there was probably 150 boats in, in, in Papietti and in, in Tahiti alone yeah. that could go nowhere. Yeah. And they weren't so, you know, yeah. and say, oh, well, here I am now, Rarotonga, you know, come save me kind of thing. Right. So they, they had, they wanted to know that actually I wasn't just making it up. I never set off to, you know, to discover myself or, yeah. or I, I didn't want to have, I didn't want to spend nine months being, being introspective yeah. or anything like that. Because yeah, like there's other ways to do that that there's don't require do this. That. You don't need to do that. Yeah. And I, and I think, yeah, there's so many other ways to do that. Like, yeah. and th there's, there's so many better ways to do it. Mm -hmm. I think where you yeah. don't have to starve. You don't have to, uh, you know, <laughs> I like to do things that are really hard. Like one of my friends once said to me, you know, he said that he, he didn't peg me as a golfer. He said, you, you play golf? I said, yeah, I, I play golf. He says, why do you like golf? I said, because it's impossible. That's why I like to play golf. It's like, it's, it's the most difficult thing you can probably do. A little ball do. in a little hole. A little ball. It's like, it's really hard. So I, I'm, and I, I don't play golf very much, but yeah. of course, but, but I, I'm drawn to things that like, that's how you end up in the special service force. Right. Like that's how you end up in, you know, jumping out of an airplane in the Arctic or digging a hole in Panama. That's how you end up yeah. You know, sailing to the Bering Sea, like the, even sailing around here is really hard. Um, so I'm just drawn to really hard things. As a sailor here, I, I guess I wanted to, I wanted to do the toughest thing that you could possibly think of doing. So for sailors, there's no tougher thing. There, there isn't anything tougher than, than, than what I did. Yeah. And I did it. I mean, you can do it. There's just no tougher way to do it. And I was drawn to that. I, I wanted to do the toughest things. I, 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 I've taught a lot of sailing. I don't like to say, well, you know, you should try this. But I don't know. Maybe I've, I haven't really tried that. <laughs> so I don't, like the, I don't like the, you know, this little implied negation at the end of the, you know, at the end of the sentence. Right. I, I chose the toughest thing you could do, and then I made it harder by doing celestial navigation. Yeah. So one of the things is, and I, this is my dad, I think, or it's, it's certainly something to do in the Army, is that, you know, you got to lead by example. So it's not just, you know, it's, it's one thing to say something. You know, it's something to say, I know how to sail, or I've sailed here and there. But it's something else to, to have done it. So, you know, it's just nice to put a stamp on something and say, I did it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what happens after that. Yeah. People, and it is interesting, because I've had lots of conversations. I'm, I'm, I have, you know, I'm a pretty experienced sailor before I went. And then you would talk to some other people who are other sailors, and, they, and you know their experiences are slightly different than yours, and they kind of look at you sideways because you know people, sailors are tend to be pretty opinionated. I mean, just every everyone's boat is the most beautiful boat in the world. It's like you know <laughs> race car drivers. So I have the fastest car. The royal we is there because it's it's you and the boat that mm -hmm. are the companion that you depend on each other. You know, and and so. I know so you use that a lot in your in your blog mm -hmm. entries too. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you must. Uh, did you have times where you you, you you did you have cold conversations with uh, you know salty or with the boat or or were you fairly quiet when you're working through some of these things and yeah, dealing with I, the frustrations? Yeah, I, I never had conversations like that. Yeah. Like I'm not a talker. Yeah. So I'm not. I, I mean, you're you're, you're telling you're you're talking to yourself, of in, in course. Your mind, but I yeah. never I'm never having an ongoing conversation yeah. with the boat. Yeah. Like I, there, there was, there was, you know, I guess there was, there was just these unbelievable bursts and flurry of profanity when things weren't going right. Yeah. And that's pretty, I mean, uh, that, it's interesting because I've, I've, I've talked to a few people who are really calm. They just, they seem to be these incredibly centered, very, very, um, focused, very balanced people. And then they say, yeah, things are going south and they just, this, and I, for me, it, it comes out because that's that's the army bird comes out, you know. When you've got, yeah, so you yeah. got to stand back when that happens. I used to tell people. One of my friends asked me, he said, "What was your job in the army?" And I said, "My job was to make grown men cry. That was my job as <laughs> an officer, you know, <laughs> platoon commander." And I did it with a smile, but I don't, I don't think he was smiling when I said uh, it. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, that yeah. was a long. Yeah. But but it's yeah. You, the boat is. If like it's easy to sail the boat to bits. There's a guy in the Vendee Globe, which is the single-handed round-the-world race now. These guys are racing these, they're basically Formula One boats, you know, all carbon mm -hmm. foils, <laughs> doing 30 knots. And he broke his boat in half. Wow. So he was, it was, the conditions were mild, like less than 25 knots of wind. Jeez. Waves are only sort of 15 feet, which is just like normal. And he stuffed the bow into a wave doing 27 knots, and, he, and, the, bow, and, the, and the boat broke in half 
just in front of the main bulkhead, just wow. by the mast, just went like this. And within three minutes, the boat was gone. So, and another guy, Alex Thompson, you might, if you're a sailor, you might know him. He just, he sailed the bow off of Hugo Boss and then busted the rudder, had to quit. Hmm. Hugo Boss is probably 80, 70 million dollars worth of boat. Hmm. But the point is, you can sail any boat to bits. That's easy to do. That's and right. the boat will just do it until it's just broken. Yeah. And it's just amazing what, because I would get out there and think, I can't believe the boat's going to make it. Yeah, because you were facing way more than 25 knot winds. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah, I'm, you're, it's, I, I was concerned about that. It's one of the yeah. reasons why my trip was slow compared to, say, Tony Gooch or some other people. Right. Um, you know, Jan, Jan Socrates, her trip was close to 300 days because she was over because she was sailing so conservatively. And, you know, Suburban is, I mean, it's to me, I, I always say it's like taking an RV on the Paris de Dakar rally. You can do it, but it's not recommended. So this is the boat that I go cruising with. It's the one I've had all my kids on. We go yeah. bombing around here. You know, yeah. I to draw, I sail it over to Vancouver and yeah. you know, park it in False Creek. Yeah, it's beautiful inside. It's not one of these flat out, you know, go fast race boats. Yeah. It's not like that at all. So, not being that kind of boat, you know, I don't have crash bulkheads. I don't have watertight bulkheads. You know, I don't. It's not a metal. Yeah. You know, none of that stuff. So I sailed really conservatively. And, um, yeah, it's easy to sail the boat to bits. So you're, you're, I, I have, I'm patting her, like I'm saying, you know, yeah. good on you. Yeah, yeah. Good on you. That was, because the, the boat will take way more than you. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah. you can still be, like, it's, by the time I got back, by the time I'm coming up the Pacific, you know, I was going upwind in 40 to 45 knots, like pounding my way upwind because I had, hmm. it was the only thing I could do and. That was that was the best course of action, but I wasn't sailing that hard going down. Mm -hmm. But coming back, like here, like upwind, forty, like fifty or between forty-five and sixty degrees apparent, and you've got it just everything as hard as you can get, and you're just thrashing the living daylights out of it. It's you can't even live down below. Yeah. Like it, and it, the whole boat's underwater. Spray is there's spray over top of the over the top of the mast. So it's. But I didn't sail that hard going down. But the point is, if you, I said, okay, well, I can do this for a short while. Yeah. I can't do this for six months because the boat will just come apart. There's a cultural norm now of cultivating mindfulness and and uh, you know being in the moment and all of that and and I think that when people were reading or hearing about your experience, they probably the default thing is to think, oh, I bet you they got a chance to really look in deeply to you know my soul and have time to ponder, dangle my feet off the stern. <laughs> You know, yeah. but that's their projecting, yeah, right? Of course. You know, and 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 and, and no, it's not like yeah. that. Your 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 day is made up of. Like, I I was thinking this as I was coming here too. Probably the closest analogy that I could get to my experience or thinking of, you know, is is the idea of you know playing a sport that's all consuming, physically demanding. You know, you, you're in a sport. Your mind it has to be on the ball, literally. Yeah. And uh, yet you never can no. go to the dugout and take a break. No, 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 that's, 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 it's nine, well, I was, it was 265 days. So, so it was nine months where you're, where you have to operate at the highest possible level, nonstop. Yeah. It's unrelenting and unforgiving. Yeah. And somebody, somebody wrote me and said, you know, what are you doing your time off? And I said, the time off, so I sent him my schedule. This is what I do on a daily basis. And he, he wrote back, oh. I, that's all he wrote back. Oh, and I thought, I wonder. You know, there's no magic button you press that says "sail me now." I don't have that on my boat. The "sail yeah. me now" button. Yeah. So people don't. Yeah. There's no. There's yeah. even I because I, I, on other trips I've 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 had some time off. Yeah. And I, so I took a whole library. So I took all the I took all the important books I thought I should read from cover to cover. And I never opened one of them. There's just no time. Yeah. I spent three hours between two and three hours a day just navigating. So yeah. then that was really tough. Yeah, you were saying, like yeah. describing that, and that was the thing I wanted to ask you about too with Dead Reckoning. You you, you described a, a chunk of time where you had like six or seven weeks where you mm -hmm. couldn't do mm -hmm. a sighting. And, yeah. and, you know, in my bare minimum knowledge of, of sailing, 
doesn't that just it has the potential to multiply an error yes. times an error time and you could be yeah. a hundreds of thousand kilometers off course in that time well you can't be a thousand kilometers okay, that, that you can't. pretty crazy yeah. and, and i was lucky at that time i was going pretty much straight east right so as soon as you start going all over the compass north south you know east west then it gets to be really tough yeah but during that stretch the weather was i won't say settled but i was going pretty much you know um, right. easterly so that was okay there was other parts of the trip where um i didn't have I, you know, I wasn't able to take a site for much shorter periods of time, like three, four, five days, and and I was, you know, farther out mm-hmm. from well, I was farther away. Well, the error in my position was greater than it was after that great big long length of time. Right. So, and you can you can all you can do something even though you don't get you know even though you can't take a you know, like a, a say a, a set of simultaneous bodies so you get the sun, the moon, or say the the moon and Venus and a couple stars or whatever the case might be where you actually get a bunch of lines of position that cross. Mm-hmm. You get, you, maybe you get one and you, and you know it's crap, right? But it's the best you have. Mm-hmm. So let's say that the, 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 the equivalent would be, say you're, you have to drive down the middle of the Strait of Georgia and you say, well, I'm going to shade you know, a little bit to the, to the west. And then you go by, you get a look at Gabriola from 20 miles, you know, from say 10 miles away the middle of the street. Okay, well, that's Gabriola. So you're, Within ten miles of Gabriola, so the, the 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 analogy would be, I would get a really crappy sun site, and I, I knew that it was no good, but it's better than nothing. So mm-hmm. even the worst sun site is is better than nothing. Mm-hmm. And um, it's I guess the way to look at it, it sounds terrible that you didn't have this position for so you know this really definitive position for such a great length of time. But if you drove from Vancouver to Calgary, you wouldn't care until you got to Calgary. <laughs> Right, yeah. right. You'd be bombed down the highway. Where are we? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I got three, four. I got five more hours. You know, right, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But then when you get to Calgary, it's like, geez, you know, which highway you got to take? Suddenly, your your navigation has to sharpen up. Okay. So when you're in the middle of the ocean, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. I was concerned, and I, I wrote about this that that I wanted. It's not because I'm going to hit some land, but I'm concerned about my uh, the weather forecasting because 20 miles plus or minus makes a huge difference. Right. 100 miles is could be life or death. Yeah. So I was. I mean, that's where you spent all your time navigating was trying to avoid, you know, right. getting wiped out. Yeah, and you said uh, in quite a few entries of, about just the turn and waiting for the turn and knowing that it's coming. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of it, a lot of your time is, over, like you say, of the weather. It's overwhelmed yeah. by just where's that wind coming from and when is this going to turn because yeah. you've got to change sail. And Yeah, you've got to, if you... If you uh, all the trouble happens when the wind changes. And the Southern Ocean, the wind, like it's blowing like fury, like it's blowing mm-hmm. really hard. Mm-hmm. Typically it'll blow from the north really hard. And then as soon as it switches to the south or southwest, which is what happens, mm-hmm. then that, that wind immediately pumps up the, the, the existing swell. So the existing swell is always 15 feet or 18 feet or something like that, 6 meters or so, mm-hmm. generally 5 to 6. Mm-hmm. And as soon as it starts blowing, then it just it just just keeps it up. this incredibly wild sea because you have the old wind and waves coming from the north and then you've got this massive you have the pre-existing swell that's now pumped up and then the wind has changed so if you miss the shift then the boat is just it's like the worst thing in the world and everyone you know that you read or talk or talk to they're all doing the same thing right yeah. and you're up at night in the pitch black, trying to make the call, you know, when the wind shifts. And you know, Suburban suffered a lot because I wasn't, can't always get it, you know, yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah. But it's tough. So, yeah, anyway, it's the weather. That's, that's the, the, the navigational challenges. And then I think of sailors through the millennia, and, you know, I'm sure sleep deprivation was part of the 
the uh, the catalyst for maybe seeing the sea serpents or the mermaids or things <laughs> like. But you, you, did you? I mean, how were you dealing with that? The sleep deprivation and 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 were you was it messing with like were you making errors and mm -hmm. seeing things? All of those yeah, kind of things. Well, I I certainly wasn't hallucinating, but this kind of sleep deprivation is 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 much different than um, like you mentioned about being in the army. Like I, I've I think the longest I've stayed awake is probably seven days, but you're sleeping in, in, in 20 minute intervals. Like you're actually, you're not actually performing at the, at, you know, at the peak of your, at, you know, yeah, right, right, right. yeah, you can. Yeah. So you, you, you have these moments where you can, where you can shut down or where someone else is watching out, right? You're not actually, someone else is on guard duty you're someone else is looking after that or, so you have these moments where you can actually power down, but, but there aren't, there aren't any of those. Well, I shouldn't say there aren't any, because when the weather conditions are, when it's calm, for example, the motion might be kind of weird, but even though you're not doing anything, you have to fix something, right? So you can't just say, well, I'm going to go to sleep because you got to, you have to maintain the boat. And that's not, quite often when there, when there's no wind or even, you know, when the motion's a little bit less, then, it, then you can fix what needs to get fixed. You know, you can crawl into that back little space that you could never get into otherwise. So even when you're not actually physically sailing the boat, you have to physically maintain it because you're beating the living daylights out of it, you know, the whole time. So even though I've been awake for a lot, you know, in the army, or it's it's totally different because you're you have to perform at such a high high level, and there's so much to do. So you might lie down and think, okay, I'll just close my eyes. But but as soon as you start thinking about, well, what should I be doing now? Because you can always be doing something other than sleeping. Right, you can always be doing something better than sleeping, so you have to manage that. And the first question that most solo sailors ask you is like, you know, what, what's your sleep regimen? What what are you doing? So Alex Thompson, for example, this guy in the Golden or the Fondy Globe that most English people know about, he's right. he has a sleep coach, a sleep doctor. He trains to sleep in twenty minute increments over the course of like six or eight months. He has this guy who just hardwires it into him. So that's that's his sleep regimen. So. <laughs> When I was asked that, I said, I hadn't really thought about it, but I, I knew that, so I was experimenting. So I, I had I had weaned myself down to an hour of sleep at a time. And that was probably the first maybe 40 days. Hmm. Um, because I felt if I got an hour, then, you know, that'd be fine. And then maybe an hour some other time in the day or at night. But after about 40 days of that, you I couldn't function anymore. So I was getting physically weak. Um... I was stumbling around the boat literally like I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, normally I'm not that, you know, clumsy. So you can't walk around a bit yeah. like a, you so know, a that's, cat. That's a wake up call. So <laughs> literally. I was, so literally. So I was, I was <laughs> clumsy and then I, w I was, I had no strength. I was starting to get really weak. Mm -hmm. And I, the worst thing was that my, my mental um, acuity was going downhill noticeably. And I noticed it when I couldn't make a decision anymore. So I was having trouble. Like I'd walk by the dishes and the dishes could, consist of a bowl, right? Or an Nalgene <laughs> cup and a fork mm -hmm. or a spoon. Mm -hmm. I'd walk, I got to do the dishes, man. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't decide now that now was a good time. And, you know, 20 minutes later, I got to do the dishes. And an hour later, I can't believe I haven't done the dishes yet. So I couldn't make it. So when you can't make a decision like that, then you're in trouble because you have to be able to make a decision whether, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad because they're not always going to be right. That's the whole, one of the points, right? So you... You just got to make a decision, and then if it's not a good one, you'll find out pretty soon. And if it's a good one, then you'll find out pretty soon as well. So, <laughs> but you got to make a decision. And if you can't make a decision, then you're screwed in every every which way. So, when I was getting an hour's sleep at a stretch, then I was I was getting weak. I was getting confused. I, my mental acuity was going downhill, and I was getting uncoordinated. All bad things, right? <laughs> And so I, I then went to like an hour and a half. So I went from 60 minutes to 90. So then I would bounce between 90 and basically, uh, well, two hours seemed like, like 240 minutes is a long, yeah. seemed like an awful yeah. long, or yeah. no, sorry, 180, no, 120 minutes seemed like a long time. Yeah. So it was anywhere between 90 and say, uh, maybe 110, right. never quite two. So yeah, and 90, according to sleep therapists, is a, what they call a sleep cycle. Yeah. Like where you do yeah. go through a little ram and deep and then you're going to yeah. come so back I, up. I, so that's, that's exactly what happened to me. So I, yeah. I, I pushed it up to, you know, about 90, and then I felt fine. And then I would sort of drop it down, not feel so good. So I, I went anywhere. So if I went to sleep, I would try to sleep for 90 minutes at least. And if I got two hours sleep, then that was, that was 
that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But by the time two hours rolled around, I was wide awake. I was thinking, okay, I've been lying there for five minutes thinking, I better get up, you know. Because it's constantly changing. The weather is never the same. Yeah. The boat is never the same. The boat just doesn't steer itself exactly where it's supposed to go, you know, for the next two hours. Right. So, um, and then I got, I would get those, say, two hours or 90 minutes, and I would be awake for an hour and a half, another 90, and then I'd go to sleep for another 90 minutes. So I, I always had two periods of sleep. And then I tried to get a 20-minute nap during the day because that's how I survived in the Army. You get these 20-minute naps. 40 minutes and you're gone. Like, you're just too tired. Mm -hmm. Then you wake up really groggy, but 20 minutes, you get up, you seem to be fine. And I, you can sleep anywhere. Yeah. So what I found was, I felt, you asked how long can you do it. You can't do it forever because you get really tired. And you end up, like, I fell asleep standing up, sitting down, eating, drinking. I fell asleep sitting on the toilet. I fell asleep writing I fell asleep typing on my blog. I fell asleep navigating. I fell asleep turning the winch handle like this on the boat. So as soon as your body sh stop, stops doing something and you, and you tell it that this isn't really that important, because you know this turning of the winch is not that important, then your body it just it'll just go. Yeah, your brain. Blink. Yeah, you're saying time to shut down, and, body. And you just go. This is, what right. the hell am I doing this for? <laughs> and I woke up a few times in the cockpit like that on the other side of the cockpit because you're you fall asleep and the next thing you know the boat has got you going somewhere else. So you get, you woke, I fell out of, I got thrown out of bed five times. Yeah. And I remember that because you wake up, you wake up, it's funny, you wake up midair, which is always exciting, right? So you're asleep. And, you're <laughs> and that's asleep. just not the nightmare that you have where you wake up because no. you think you're falling. You're no. actually falling. No, when you, when you have, you, 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 in your dreams, you're flying. But in your, in your nightmares, you, you're, you've woken up and you're not hitting oh, the deck. Oh, man. And you hit in some awful, terrible place. Right? Well, of course. Or in way, right? Because you're. So, yeah, so and I would not strap myself in or put up the lee, lee cloths when the conditions were settled, thinking, okay, I, it's probably not that bad. And then I would get thrown out of bed. And what about, like, do you remember, I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of person when I go to sleep I, I, and I wake up, I'm coming out of a coma. I never remember my dreams. I've never tried to remember my dreams so yeah. much. But did you, did you get anything like, geez, I'm dreaming about home or I'm dreaming about, you know, steaks or something? No, no, I never had any of those dreams. <laughs> but early on in the trip, I I would wake up and and I would wake up thinking that there was someone in the boat. Hmm. So I would and it, there was never anybody I knew. There was somebody I had emailed or something like that. Yeah, and I would good. wake up after the you know I'd wake up and because the last thing I did at night because I was I wrote at I wrote at night I wrote because it yeah. was the only time that because um, you have to take advantage of the day because um, mm -hmm. you know that's when it's easiest to get the boat going and mm -hmm. you can see everything and but at nighttime it's pitch black. What can you do? Can you know? So that's when I wrote, and I would write, and then I would fall asleep, and then I would, at the beginning of the trip, I, I would, I had, I would wake up, and you know, just before you wake up, I think there's someone here with me, and I just wrote them, you know. But they've, they've somehow been embodied, right, in that, in yeah. your subconscious. Yeah, my brother said that everybody. He said everybody wants to be on the boat with you, yeah. for a couple hours. Yeah, <laughs> and they want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> which is a good way to look at it. I think so. Stay tuned for Chapter 2, where we cover more of the adventures of Bert's ocean epic voyage.